Hey everybody, I, I wanted to throw this part in. I made the video ahead of time, which you're going to see in a second, uh, as a little bit of a forward. This uh, lesson is probably for somebody who's made it through Algebra 1 already. I'm going to cover some concepts about patterns and expressions. It's kind of first day, first week Algebra 2 stuff. So uh, if you Prob if you haven't had Algebra 1, it might be a little dense of information. Algebra 2 people, you should have seen most of it before and be like, oh yeah, I remember that. It's just me sort of reminding you how to go through the process and whatnot. So a um, little bit longer than you would expect. So if you haven't had Algebra 1, it might be a little much or maybe not. Who knows? So make your own decision. So uh, first we're going to talk about patterns. And patterns are uh, essentially a sequence or a grouping of numbers that have a consistent change between them. So maybe the numbers go up by two, or maybe they're pictures. And in fact, the first one we're going to do, or the one that we're going to look at as primarily as a pattern, is one that is a pictorial representation. Just to get to you to understand the idea that, or to see the idea that it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with numbers from a visual perspective, even though it has everything to do with numbers otherwise, because there's a connection. Now, what comes next? That's what we're looking for. We want to know, if I was going to draw another shape, uh, probably as badly as I drew the ones that I already have here, what would it look like? What I need to look at is how much things, or what changes between one and the other, uh, between one group and another, and how much, and about what amount. So if I look at this, I mean, the pictures are different, but I'm probably going to look at something like sides. So in this case, I have one, two, three sides with my triangle, my uh, rectangle. I was going to call it a square, but that would be way too nice. Um, a pentagon has five, and then of course the hexagon has six. So what I'm looking at is the idea that for each uh, see for each term in the sequence, I'm going up by one. So let's talk about term versus value. The idea of what that means. Now the term would be the number in the pattern. So this is my first term, so my term number would be 1. This is my second term. It's where it falls in. So when you hear me say the word term, it means where does it fall in place in this pattern that they've shown me. The value would be um, what I'm looking for. So the amount of needed info. The needed info here is how many sides. So the amount here would be three. So I could say that my term, if I was going to make a chart, which is kind of a big deal, and we'll do it a little bit more later, my term would be one, two, three, and four. This is my first term, so its value is three. My second term has a value of four. My third term has a value of five. And my fourth term has a value of six. So, I mean, without that's the mathematical basis of the idea but really I mean it's seven six sides so I know I need to make a seven-sided figure and this should be hilariously bad so you can see how I drew six-sided figures so I'm gonna try this thing one two three four five six one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So that's kind of a seven-sided figure. It looks terrible. I know I'm not the best artist on planet Earth. In fact, I might be the worst artist on planet Earth. Who knows? But the reality is a seven-sided figure would come next because of the way that it's going up. So that's patterns in terms of the general idea of what they look like. Let's talk about expressions, and then we'll get back into sort of combining them together. Now, the idea of an expression in an algebraic sense is that there's two types, or an algebra sense, not algebraic sense. Um, there's two types. There's numerical expressions and there's algebraic expressions. Uh, there are potentially more, but the ones we're going to talk about today are those two. Um, numerical expressions are statements that contain numbers and operating symbols. So we're talking about the idea of adding and subtracting, so it has a plus in it. So 4 plus 5 would be a perfectly appropriate num uh, numerical expression. I may even put um, parentheses in it to make a statement. So any of those mathematical operators, I'm pretty good at in terms of it being a numerical expression. Now, from there, I should say um, that if I have the, the key component to an algebraic expression, I'm stepping over myself, is that it has a variable in it, or one or more variables. So if I start throwing in the x, 
or the y, or whatever it happens to be, I'm looking at an algebraic expression because that's a variable in it. And in terms of a variable uh, versus a constant, a constant has a consistent value. In most cases, when I'm talking about constants, I'm talking about numbers. So a plus 5, that 5, uh, like in this case, the plus 5 here, that's a constant, a consistent value. So I can say 5 is a constant. We have some uh, things that are symbolic that have consistent values, or we, uh, we've agreed that they do. Pi, for instance. Pi, we know, is the 3.14 and a bunch of other numbers that tends to go on forever. But we all see it, and that's what we assume that we're supposed to use or what we're supposed to plug in, and assuming we're doing math and you know, we're not Greek, uh, like ancient. But the other side of it would be the variable component to it. Um, variable would mean that the value can change. That's when we're looking at x, y, and that whole thing. But the reality is um, there's a couple ways that you can evaluate the value of a variable. One is to define it by saying x is equal to this number. Or you may set up an equation, uh, 4x plus 5 equals something, and the limits that you've created around it tell you what the variable's value happens to be. If it's greater than less than, it has uh, multiple values, but it has a whole set of them. So it is what it is. That's expression vocabulary. Now, from there, we're going to go and sort of combine them together a little bit by looking at patterns and algebra. That's where we're headed. Now, we're going to create our table first anytime we have this sort of pattern and algebra thing. You don't have to create the table. If you could do it visually, that's fine. I'm okay with that. But my, my table is going to include terms, and it's also going to include values. I could say it's input versus output. So my terms are 1, 2, and 3 because those are the only ones on the paper. And I'm going to leave a little bit of space for a reason. The values are how many, I'm going to do how many lines or how many sides. I'm not going to do how many, uh, I could call these squares if I was being nice. But this one is 1, 2, 3, 4. This one has 8. And this one has 12. Obviously, you could tell what the next number in sequence is because it's just going up by 4 every time. It's pretty simple. But if I were to need more information than that, I may be well served by creating a little bit of a table even if it's not lined up exactly right. Um, the thing that I need to do is look for something called the nth term. That would be in the letter term. N stands for number here. What that means is a number of term that I'll plug in. What I'm looking for is sort of a machine that can help me get to whatever term that I want. So if I say, what's the 600th term in sequence? What's its value? I could plug in the 600 into the uh, nth term setup, and it would tell me what the value is, which is very convenient. Especially if you have to do something that you don't want to, I don't want to do this out 600 or 597 more times or whatever it happens to be. Uh, so I'd rather just find out what the 600th term in sequence is. Now, in order to do that, I need to look at what kind of changes are occurring. So I'm going to look at how the right side changes. And if I was doing a graph here, I'd call this the Y. And over here, I'm going to see what changes are going on over there. Now this one is only going up by 1 every time. This one tends to go up by 4. The nice thing about this is if I have consistent change here and consistent change here, I get a real good look at what this nth term is going to look like. Because if this is, if I only go out one group and get the same numbers, so I only had to compare them one time and they both gave me 4, um, or both compare them one time and I get 1 here, I'm looking at a linear uh, relationship, which means it's a line. So if I were to graph this, for instance, it would look something like that. I can tell because it's consistent. Now what I'm going to do is use a little bit of what I learned about in maybe Algebra 2, or Algebra 1, I'm sorry, about the slope-intercept form. Now the slope-intercept form is the perfect vehicle for us to get that, get from one place to another. I plug in this, that would be my term, and then I would get this. Now in order to do that, I need to find both parts of slope-intercept. The slope, which really represents change, and the intercept, which would mean that that would be where my starting point is. So where did I start and how am I going? And I can sort of get an idea of where I'm going to be at certain points on my trip, as long as I'm going in a straight line. And I am because it's going up consistently on both sides. Now, I need to find out what the change is. And I see that if I take this 4 and divide by the 1, that I'm really going up 4 every time. So the nice thing in this linear relationship is that I can just plug the 4 in right here. 
Then I need to find my starting point, which means I have to create a term that doesn't exist. If I can get back to term 0, that's no movement at all. So it's where did I start out? It gives me a good place to where I need to go from. So I've been going up 4 every time on this one, but if I just went down 4, 4 minus 4 is 0. So I can say that I'm starting out at the 0 point. If it was on a graph, it would mean it would start right here at that origin point, that middle. So consistently from my nth term in sequence, all I do is take my x value, make it an n, and my new nth value says 4 n. If you want to put the plus 0 there, you can, but not really necessary. So let's test it, okay? So if I wanted the second term in sequence, it should be 8. Well, if I trade these out, and remember if 4 and n touch, it's multiply. 4 times 2 is 8, so that means that it does match what I want it to be. If it's the third term, 4 times 3 is 12, that seems to work too. So in my theoretical 600th term in sequence, all I would do is 4 times 600. So my 600th term in sequence would give me 2400. That's a nice thing to be able to use. So I'm going to use my nth term there. Works out pretty well. Let's do one more of those relatively quickly, I hope. I'm going to go ahead and start with my table, my term, and then I'm going to do my value. My term here would be term 1, term 2, and term 3. My value, we're going to look at tiles, or number of these little squares. 1, 2, 3, 4. In this one, there's 6. In this one, there's 8. Now I'm going to look to see if there's any consistency in the change. That's good, because it's 2. On this side, of course, we're going up by 1. So I'm going to say that this is linear. If it was, by the way, if this changed like um, I got a different number here, and then I looked at the differences and ended up getting the same number in the second column out, then it would be uh, quadratic, so it would be x squared type question, and if it goes out again, it's x to the third, that whole thing. Now, let's uh, go back to this slope-intercept form for just a minute. And a lot of these you can just figure out, but sometimes it's easier to have a, way, a consistent way to do it. So my change would be this divided by this, or my slope which is 2. So I can say that my m is going to be 2. My x is whatever I happen to plug in, and my b would be where I start. So I need to go to the 0 term. As you can see, on this side, uh, on this side I'm going up by 1. On this side I'm going up by 2. So instead of going up by 2, I need to go down, and 4 minus 2 is 2. So this is my starting off point. So that's what my equation is going to end up looking like for my nth term. I'm just going to write n there instead of x. Let's test it. If I plug in 2, I get 2 times 2, which is 4, plus 2 more, gives me 6. If I do 3, 3 times 2 is 6, plus 2 more, gives me 8. That's a perfect nth term in sequence. If I need the 600th term, same type of thing. I just plug it in right here. I put a little parentheses in, plug in whatever term I need to do, and then plus 2. That's my nth term. Pretty simple stuff, um, if you, especially if it's linear like this. More advanced stuff, we, we might get into that in a little while. Not in this video, but in a different one. Uh, let's talk about the last step. We're going to talk a little bit about graphing, because it's sort of the juxtaposition of those two ideas. Um, in this case, I'm going to make another table. So my term versus my value. Um, so I'm going to say at 1, and really this is your x and this is your y in case you didn't remember. Um, the x on the bottom would be your term value and your y would be your um, the actual overall value. This is considered to be an independent variable. If no matter how, if I have zero pairs of pants, I can't have a total cost. The cost thing doesn't come into play until I, until I start buying pants, so the number of pants is independent of the cost. Um, not emotionally, but in this case. So pair of pants here, I'm going to say I bought uh, 1, 2, and 3, so 1, 2, and 3. I should have left a little more space up there, but I didn't, so what are you going to do? Um, from there, I'm going to say the first one is at 2, so it's $2. The next one gives me up to $4, and the last one gives me up to $6. Now, there's a couple ways I can do it. I can do it like I did before, or I can look at these in terms of coordinate points. So like this. Then I can use the slope formula instead of just doing the comparisons. It'll give me the same information, but sometimes it's nice to use the slope formula. And it's good to see it again, and if you haven't seen it in a while. That's the slope formula. The difference in y's minus the difference of x's. So if I have 1, 2, and 2, 4, I'm going to mark everything up like they're supposed to. x comes before y in both groups. This is the second group, and this is the first group. So my y sub 2 here would be 4 minus y sub 1 would be 2, x of 2 would be 2, 
minus x of 1 would be 1. If I work this out, 4 minus 2 gives me 2. 2 minus 1 is 1. So my slope value or my ch rate of change value here would be 2, which is probably going to go in front of the old x, right? So I'm going to say 2 in, or if I was doing it like this, in the y equals mx plus b form, you can't see it, I just realized, um, plug the 2 in right there. Now I still need to find my starting off point. So on this one, I'm going up every time by 2. On this one, I'm going up every one by 1. So I can say at the 0 point, I'm going down 2. So 0 is it. So I can say my nth term in sequence would be 2 in. Now, I can use this information if I choose to. What, how, many, how, many, uh, how much money would you pay for six pairs of pants? Well, I would say is 2 times 6. So six pairs of pants would be $12. If I needed 10, um, it would give me $20 as my output. So it's kind of convenient. The other one more quick thing I need to talk about is the dots versus the line. Most graphs you probably see a line there. And I know this is a lot of information. I'm going to try to finish it. it. It's the difference between what's called discrete and what's called continuous. Um, discrete values means that there's di there's chain there's nothing in between them. I can only buy one pair of pants. I can't buy a quarter of a pair of pants and pay a quarter of the price. They probably don't do that. So I don't have any numbers in here that actually exist. Continuous ideas means you can plug in anything, including fractions, and get an answer. So if you see a line, it means all possibilities. If it little dots, it means just individual points that you can access based on the information. So that's it. I know it's a little long. Usually I try to keep videos as short as possible, but it's a lot of information to cover very quickly, but there it is. So good luck.